All right, we'll get underway, 12.15. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Lubar Center here at Marquette University Law School. Eckstein Hall, I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. It's our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers and people who are doing simply interesting and important work in this region and beyond. Today we're going to be talking about the, the startup scene in the Milwaukee area and in the state of Wisconsin. Um, next week, as some of you in this room know, is Startup Week in Wisconsin, where we really try to draw uh, some attention and focus on the importance and the significance of startups, early stage companies, to the economic fortunes of uh, Wisconsin and Milwaukee. Uh, to help us with our conversation today, we have three young entrepreneurs, and let me give you just a little bit of background on each of them. Matt Cordio is the gentleman sitting next to me. Matt is the founder of Startup Milwaukee and Skills Pipeline. I, I think you've described yourself as a technology talent scout. Is that, is yes. that pretty, pretty yes. accurate? Uh, he's also a guy who's sort of born to, to start companies. He said he started his first uh, business while he was still a student here at Marquette University. That is correct. And you said that one didn't work. That one did not work, and <laughs> that, I, I, I still did okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's all part of the discussion we'll have today. You're okay. Exactly. Amanda Baltz. Amanda is the uh, CEO of Spalding Medical, and her company makes electrocardiograms uh, for use in homes, hospitals, post-acute care facilities. Uh, she, too, is a Marquette University graduate, so welcome back. Thank you. And Richard Yao is the co-founder and CEO of Bright Sellers. Bright Sellers is a, uh, a monthly subscription service for wine drinkers, isn't it, Richard? I mean, that's, yeah. that's really what we're talking about. This thing, they now have 18,000 18, yep, subscribers. 18,000 yeah. subscribers for his monthly wine club. Uh, Richard is not from uh, Marquette University. He's from MIT out in Boston and came to Milwaukee a few years ago. So today we're going to be talking about the startup culture in Milwaukee, how we're doing, what we could be doing better. Won't you please give a warm welcome to our three guests today. So I mentioned this uh, coming week is Startup Week in Wisconsin, and Matt Cordio has been, been involved in that. This will be celebrated in 10 cities around the state. And, and Matt, let's begin with you. Why do we need a, a Startup Week in Wisconsin? What are you trying to accomplish? So this was really founded out of an effort that we, we began last year here in Milwaukee where we uh, decided to create a week dedicated to connecting, educating, and really celebrating the region's entrepreneurs here in southeast Wisconsin. Uh, we saw the momentum and energy that was created by Milwaukee Startup Week last year and had a couple cities around the state participate um, just hosting one-off events. And a lot of them said, we want to be involved in this energy, momentum, and excitement, too, because we view entrepreneurs as important to the future of Wisconsin's economy. And uh, now we, we have 10 cities uh, this year. Um, we have more lined up for next year, so that's exciting news. And uh, it's really all about building momentum in, in Wisconsin's startup community and, and starting to change the culture in Milwaukee and Wisconsin to be um, really one that embraces and supports high growth technology entrepreneurship as the future of, of our economy in the 21st century. We'll get into a much deeper discussion on a number of those points in just a moment, but I thought it might be helpful to learn more about the businesses of each of our three guests. And Amanda, I'll begin with you on that. Tell us a little bit about your company today, where the idea came from, and, and what you hope to accomplish with it. Sure. So. Um, Spalding Medical is a private spin-off of our parent company, Spalding Clinical Research. Spalding Clinical Research was founded um, about 10 years ago um, by my, my father, as well as a few other individuals, and um, we grew that business to be a drug development firm um, and do drug testing for pharmaceutical companies all over the world. And along the way, we identified the need for a small footprint ECG uh, technology to be able to um, help the pharmaceutical companies collect a lot of heart data around the world. So we designed um, a handheld device for the pharmaceutical research industry. And as those trials were beginning to end, the sites that they were at were asking us if they could keep it. And that's when we knew we had an application and opportunity in the commercial market as well. Um, so being a drug research firm with a device, we decided it made sense to have a separate focus and team and effort around bringing a medical device and software solution into both commercial and research markets. And so um, we started that spinoff, and now today 
We are um, in just about 1,000 commercial sites. Um, th so that means you know, your nursing homes, your um, oncology clinics, um, as well as in over 37 countries for clinical research. And, and how long has your firm been around, the, the spinoff? So the spinoff, um, really the separate focus started in 2015. That's a lot of growth. Yeah. In a very short period yes. of time. Yes. Speaking of growth, Richard, uh, tell us about Bright Cellars, when it, when it began and, and, and the story of its already fledgling success. Yeah, sure. So Bright Cellars, um, my, my co-founder Joe and I founded it actually in Boston in 2014. And uh, Bright Cellars is a personalized monthly wine subscription where we match our subscribers to wine. And how it works is that you have the ability to rate and review each of the wines that you're receiving. And what we're doing behind the scenes is we're using our, ma our matching algorithm to get better at matching you to wine over time. Sort of a new piece of the business and uh, we're where we're evolving is that we're beginning to understand um, our consumer, the wine consumer, um, much better than existing wine companies. So we have an understanding through our data of what types of wines will do well in the market, who wants them, and uh, really understanding sort of wine from a data science perspective. So that's something that's uh, sort of exciting for us. And uh, we're using now that data to inform the winemaking process itself. So for example, uh, we're looking at a type of person who might be interested in in a higher acidity wine or a lower bitterness wine. or um, and, and really with our customer, what we've been able to do is bring somebody who otherwise wouldn't know what wine to pick up off the shelf uh, to a place where they feel comfortable and have tried a lot of wines that they otherwise wouldn't try. So for those of you in the room that are into wine, everyone's probably who's into wine has had a Chardonnay or a Pinot Noir, but um, we're looking at the world of wine. And there's so much great wine available out there that we can make available uh, to our consumers. So uh, we ended up in um, Milwaukee, and actually a very, uh, that big, big piece of uh, what drove our move here was we participated in the Generator Accelerator, Accelerator Program in 2015, um, and also uh, we're fortunate enough to uh, raise a $2 million round of investment led by CSA Partners based out of uh, Milwaukee. So um, we had uh, the training, the funding, and also wanted to be a part of, the, of, uh, of what is the beginning of, uh, of a, a, a new startup community here and uh, uh, we we moved into Ward 4 um, which is um, uh, which is uh, which has been well we moved into Ward 4 in 2015 and uh, since then we've grown to uh, we've grown to 37 employees and the 18,000 members that Mike mentioned I'm gonna get to Matt in a second to help tell his story but I do have to ask a question so you're an MIT grad okay. um, how did you end up with the idea of going into to the wine subscription business Sure. <laughs> so um, a little bit, uh, I actually, I, so uh, my background was at MIT, I, I studied finance in business school. Okay. So, um, and uh, my roommate actually at the time, um, and, uh, and for a while longer actually, um, was a uh, computer science and algorithms guy. So uh, we actually had, um, we, we always had interesting late night conversations about sort of applications. Over for, uh, for <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> but really, the, uh, uh, the the thought was we were both 25 at the time. We were comfortable with craft beer. We didn't know the first thing about wine. We wanted to learn about it. We knew that was something that a new generation of wine drinkers was potentially facing. Um, and actually, we're seeing some of that realized now with sort of new figures showing that craft beers are becoming less popular with millennials and wine is becoming more <laughs> popular with millennials. So, And it was kind of our mindset at the time. We wanted to learn about wine, didn't know what to do, and um, decided to learn about it. And and see if there was a uh, practical applications. Uh, there was a practical application for for algorithms. Matt, tell us a little bit about the skills pipeline group, as you you call it. Yeah. Now. So we really view ourselves as a platform. Um, traditionally, we started out as a recruiting company, and I, at the same time, I kind of started this grassroots entrepreneurship group called Startup Milwaukee. Um, while I was still a student at Marquette, um, we basically decided in the last year or two bring together Startup Milwaukee, my tech recruiting firm skills pipeline into a group, and also add Wisconsin Startup Week to that platform. And really what it is is meant to be a platform for uh, high growth tech companies, startups, software product companies, digital creative agencies to access high growth, innovative talent um, in the tech space here in Milwaukee and really focus on how do we attract and retain those people here in the region. Well, let's talk a little bit about that because I want to get into how we're faring right now and. And some people in the room are familiar uh, with uh, the uh, Kaufman Index on Startup Activity. And, 
And so we see reports that came out in, in the last year that said uh, of the 25 largest states, uh, we were 25th in startup activity. Wisconsin was 25th. Or Milwaukee, out of 40 uh, larger metro areas, we were 39th in startup activity. Um, all of you want to change that and, and want to make a difference. So let me have you respond. First of all, are those numbers accurate? Some people do question the, 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 the methodology used to compile this, but are they accurate? And what's the biggest challenge in, in moving those numbers in a way that means good news for Milwaukee and Wisconsin? Amanda, let me begin with you on that. Sure. So um, I think that we've come a very long way, even in, since the time that we started Spalding Clinical Research. We have um, a lot of people like Matt and, and Startup Milwaukee and, and Health Tech uh, Milwaukee, there's a lot of um, different organizations that have started rallying around mm -hmm. supporting the startup ecosystem and, and um, you know, the private sector, Northwestern Mutual, and um, you know, different leaders in our community have started helping us um, be aware of everything that's required. So I think we've had some incredible progress. Um, I do think that it will be, you know, it, it'll take some time for us to uh, improve on, on growing that overall ecosystem. And I think something, you know, um, that, ha that we've talked about a lot lately is, um, you know, the, the non-compete environment in Wisconsin. So when you look at states that do don't have non-compete um, issues, for example, you see, you know, people who are able to leave their companies and start new, you know, they, they come up with an idea in their, in their company and then they're able to leave and go see that and run with it. And in Wisconsin, um, we don't have that. So I think that there's inherently um, an inhibition um, that's been created because of that. And I think that's something that we can look at improving. Give me your perspective, Richard. You, you grew up in the Bay Area. Uh, you, you were out in Boston, which is sort of a hub of startup activity. What are we doing well? What can we do better in the Milwaukee area? Yeah, I think um, uh, to echo what Amanda's been saying, even the past two years that we've been here, we've seen the availability of resources and the support really grow and the communities grow. And I think that's, that's fantastic. And I think, our, um, I think our hearts are in the right place as far as where we want to be. I would say the big differences between uh, San Francisco and Boston and say uh, Milwaukee, or even sort of when I, when I think back to sort of my time at MIT, there was sort of a, uh, there's sort of a, uh, well, a, a couple of things. There's a different sort of risk profile in the type of people that are starting companies and uh, the type of uh, people who are funding companies. So it's a little bit, um, it's, 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 uh, Really, it, how to put it? I think it's like uh, it's essentially a bolder environment. I was say, are we more, more conservative more here exactly, in terms we are of, of risk? Mm -hmm. We are more conservative in terms of risk, and I think that's one of. And for that, for better or worse, I actually think that's one of the reasons why we've been able to grow Bright Seller so well and growing with. Um, there are. Uh, I think there are a lot of companies out there that do have longer, uh, longer time frames as far as investment, uh, uh, payback of investment, do require uh, more work, do require larger teams, and that's sort of something that I've, I think that Milwaukee hasn't necessarily been able to participate in um, just yet. Uh, I also think that the a lot of the things when we say, you know, what are the benefits for moving um, to uh, Milwaukee? What are the benefits of the region? I think those things are great, but I think people are moving to San Francisco despite the cost of living being high, but despite sort of, you know, a lot of other factors um, uh, that aren't necessarily positive, but the, those are the type of people with, with perhaps the mindset of, you know, I'm looking at what the potential upside is rather than looking at, you know, mitigating the downside. I want to get into this talent issue uh, further in a moment, but I, d I did want to ask you, Matt, about this from your perspective. When we see reports like that, you, do you think they're telling us, I mean, it's a hard truth, but, but is it the truth? Uh, what's your take on that? I, th I think the truth is somewhere in between uh, you think the, it the number yeah. and, and reality. So I think there is a lot of momentum, and a lot of those reports are based on some data that looks um, far back, and, and so it's a lagging indicator of the momentum that mm -hmm. really is actually occurring on the ground here over the past two or three years. Um, I do think that any time Milwaukee is not a top 10 city in a list is, is a concern and something that needs to be addressed, and I think kind of as Richard and Amanda both alluded to, I think that Milwaukee needs, a, and really the state needs to embrace culture change and really kind of, um, you know, I think it, I could say this, I'm from Milwaukee, I grew up in Cedarburg, went to school at Marquette, have not left, um, but I think that at times we struggle with um, kind of a, a scarcity mentality 
Um, and I think at times we struggle what do you mean to. mean by that? Uh, scarcity so, mentality. So I think that um, you know at times we're afraid of of growth and trying new things, and uh, that there are limited resources in the state or in the region. Or, and I think that's a, a cultural challenge that needs to be addressed. I think we also need to uh, learn to uh, better embrace failure. Um, you know, I failed with my first startup. It didn't stop me, um, but I'm sure it stopped others. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's a, a challenge um, that we need to, those are really two big cultural things we need to address, I think, to, you know, not only uh, retain and grow businesses here, but also attract uh, new talent to the region. Let's talk about talent. From, from your perspective, for your company, is there an adequate pipeline of good talent for the kind of work that your company needs to do? At this moment in time, yes. You know, I think we, we have um, excellent candidates um, for a lot of the different positions we're hiring for. And give um, us an example of the kinds of jobs so, that you need people. So, you know, software development, okay. um, and then we, but we manufacture as well. So, you know, manuf um, you know assembly and, mm -hmm. um, and then as well as, you know, just overall, um, you know, sales management. Um, at this point, yes, I do worry about soft software development and the and the availability of, of good software um, development resources as we grow. That's going to be um, our largest area of growth in terms of talent. Mm -hmm. And and how has it been challenging for you uh, with your business? To you said you're up to 35 employees now. Where do they come from? Where do you find the talent you need to be successful? Yeah, so I think that was actually one of our big factors for moving to Wisconsin was uh, while we were doing the generator program, we really just had three people on the team. And by the end of the program, we had made uh, three hires that were in Wisconsin. So I think that was interesting for us because we didn't necessarily expect that. And to answer your question, we actually have not had a hard time uh, recruiting for talent here. Now, the caveat to that is you know, the, the best example is our first software engineer that we hired here had already accepted an offer to move to Silicon Valley. So what that was an indicator of was that the talent, there is talent here, there's great schools here, there's great programs here, but ultimately the type of person that's looking to work for a high growth venture funded startup, um, there's not a lot of options here. So then they are going to look elsewhere. So I think that's sort, of, that's sort of the big thing here. And it's not necessarily even just on the founder level. We're talking about these are potentially, you know, this our, our uh, first software engineer um, hire is, uh, I would hope, you know, is, is in the pool for startups starting his own company at some point, but that's somebody that you otherwise lose to Silicon Valley. So now the hope is that, you know, we're uh, at Bright Sellers, maybe there can be, you know, five or six uh, startup, co -found, uh, startup founders, startup co-founders that see themselves as being able to grow um, a, um, as being able to grow in Milwaukee. Uh, Matt, as a technology talent scout, um, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, seriously, do we have the, the talent necessary to, to live out the dreams that, that all the people in this room have? I can tell you right now we're recruiting for about 30 open software development positions. So if there are any software developers in the okay. room, uh, you know, <laughs> I got some job opportunities. We had a lot of uh, really exciting growth-focused companies in Milwaukee. But, um, you know, I think that uh, recently, I think from every level, from startups to um, large enterprises like Northwestern Mutual have identified uh, the lack of technology talent as a challenge for our region. Um, you know, earlier this week, um, John Schlifsky, the mm -hmm. CEO of Northwestern Mutual, uh, announced they would be starting a venture fund to attract startups here. And uh, part of it is to support the local economy and support the local startup ecosystem, but they view that attracting and retaining uh, really bright technology talent is, is really the foundation of that needs to be a strong startup community as well as a strong tech community. So uh, yesterday they hosted a tech mm -hmm. summit, which we were all, all in attendance at. And uh, you know, it was really exciting to hear uh, the energy and excitement um, from a company like Northwestern Mutual, also an executive from Kohl's was, was there, and talking about really the importance of um, really changing the way we do economic development in our region. Um, and, and really, it's exciting to have the private sector lead that, because I think at times, economic development in our region lags, and that's it's a, you know, a challenge for us. Um, but uh, you know, I think that it's uh, just a really exciting time, and um, exciting to see where it goes. As young entrepreneurs, how, how important is it for the private sector to sort of lead on this. Now, some of you have probably read the stories about it, so you have, in, in this case, in the last week, you have Northwestern Mutual and Aurora Healthcare, both saying we're, we're gonna take $5 million and invest in these young, early-stage companies. Um, 
granted, that's not going to change the world, uh, that amount of money, but it can make a difference. How important is it for the private sector and sort of these legacy companies to lead the way? Yeah. I think it's really important. It's interesting. One of the topics discussed at the summit yesterday was that it's not it's not charity in the sense that these are sound finance as a as finan as a financial investment as an asset class. Like in investing in startups makes sense, and that sort of I think a little bit of the a little bit of the balance here. I think with with participation from the private sector, you bring their expertise and the sensibility and sort of their operating experience, and I think that's interesting because. Because fundamentally, when you look at um, at Silicon Valley or at, or Boston, is not um, investing in startups is not a is not a community exercise. There, it is a profitable it is a profitable asset class, and, and money is going there. Whereas when when you take a look at Milwaukee, there is money available here. It's just not going into venture capital. I mean, I'll have you maybe address this too. Um, the importance of these well known corporations in our community uh, making these kinds of commitments. I think it's incredibly important. Um, I think it's, you know, I think Richard hit on all of the key points. Um, they have, uh, they have a lot of expertise. They have the ability to provide mentoring. You know, mentoring is critical um, in our startup community, and um, and and I think they also. Um, help rally additional resources and you know service providers around supporting the growth of, of new business. So I think it's um, fantastic and critically important. What's the role of government in, in all of this? Should it have a significant role or, or should it sort of butt out and, and let the free market work? Um, Matt, I'll begin with you on that. I think from the policy perspective, you know, addressing the non-compete issue, as Amanda mentioned earlier, um, you know, could be a critical role of, of government. I think um, there are things we can do. Uh, you know, there are some successful programs that the state has launched, like the Qualified New Business Venture Program, where um, investors get a tax credit for making angel investments. 25% of their investment is a, a tax credit, and that has incentivized early stage investing um, from wealthy individuals uh, here, and that's another great example of the role of government uh, playing. I think that ultimately, though, um, you know, a lot of people that have studied how startup communities are being developed in cities like Boulder, Colorado, or St. Louis, Missouri, um, you know, people come to the common uh, realization that uh, a startup community really needs to be built by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. So I think government and uh, traditional economic development agencies and the private sector um, really need to listen to the needs of entrepreneurs and, and what they need to build their companies in the region, whether it's mentorship or access to them as customers or, or better policy. Um, I think that's you know, a key, uh, key important thing that the region needs to embrace to become more of a, a hub of startup activity. Amanda, what do you think is the, the appropriate role for government in all of this? Um, I think that the Economic Development Corporation, the programs that have been available, the tax credits, um, you know, um, even just supporting new job growth through different programs, I think is is very important. Um, and then I, I also I, I do believe that the, the non-compete um, issue could be uh, could could really help propel. Can you explain that for people? Give us a, a good sense of what what you can and cannot do right now uh, based on the the non-compete. Uh, what? Um, well. Um, we, our company, is the result of um, my, you know, that the technology, um, you know, was basically my father had um, come up with this idea at his former employer. So, but for the benevolence of his former employer to allow him to go out and start his own company, we wouldn't be here. So, I today. So he could have nixed that. Correct. He, he That's could have right. said, "No, but you cannot take that." That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. um, so. So that was, um, you know, and, and we've created over 200 jobs, you know, since, um, since we started. So, you know, I really think, you know, in, in terms of other types of new, it doesn't necessarily impede our company now today, but in terms of looking at what's best for our region, I think it's um, very important. Richard? Yeah, sure. So um, I think that the... Uh, I think that the role of government in in all this is um, to really remove obstacles and uh, to uh, to allow 
entrepreneurs to move quickly. And I think that's one of the things that um, the Economic Development Corporation here, um, I think while there are successful programs, I think if you think about sort of the type of risk that an entrepreneur needs to take in order to, in order to start a company, in order to, essentially you're saying instead of, instead of going into, into a role where salary is guaranteed and it's low risk, we want you to take this plunge. There's a little bit dif uh, of a difference in terms of you know, timeline, and I'm sure we'll sort of talk about the Foxconn deal and, 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 and sort of larger economic development deals, those are running on a different timeline than sort of, you know, where, where, where Bright Sellers is. When we look at it, we're trying to grow, you know, 5%, 10% month over month for a period of two or three years. And that's something where, you know, in, in our experience, it's sort of like the programs are there to support us, but they may not be um, on the... the uh, in order to truly um, sort of encourage or um, in, encourage that uh, sort of uh, risk profile, they need to move a little bit quicker. What's the role of, uh, of um, universities and academia in all of this? We were talking up in my office before we came down here, and I said, uh, for the sake of full disclosure, my brother-in-law works in the technology business. He's been out in the Silicon Valley for some time, and, uh, and he's on a venture capital uh, course for a venture capital fund, and so they hear a lot of different pitches for products that people want to bring to market. And he said, the people who come in, almost without exception, who are pitching products are people who are from the academic world. They're teaching assistants, they're graduate students. Um, they have big ideas, and they come in and they may have a, a well thought out plan or a not so well thought out plan, but, but they have ideas of what they'd like to do. Are our universities doing enough to, to generate that kind of uh, new thinking that leads to new products? Matt, I'll begin with you on that. You know, I think they uh, realize they need to do more. And um, there's been a lot of exciting uh, momentum and activity um, from local academic institutions, uh, whether it be Marquette and under the leadership of Mike Lovell um, or uh, UWM. Um, both, I think, realize that they need to really uh, increase the amount of research being done here in Milwaukee and attract more research dollars, whether it's in freshwater sciences or engineering or medical, the medical field. You know, I think that it's, it's been very exciting to have strong, bold leadership in the community. And, uh, you know, it will take time, I think, to really evolve uh, the mindset of uh, certain faculty and uh, obviously steer these institutions, uh, which are much different than startups, in, in a new direction. But you know, I think that's a key role that universities play. But I think they also play a key role in supplying entrepreneurial talent. Um, and I think we could do a better job of getting students in the region while they're in college uh, you know, into local startups or high growth tech companies to see opportunities here. Because I've, I've met some talented uh, you know, engineering students, whether it be from Marquette, MSOE, or UWM that, for example, uh, want to go work for like innovative companies in cities like Columbus, Ohio. Somebody just told me they were moving to work for Progressive Insurance, a very innovative company, I'm sure. Um, but um, you know, how do we get a student like that into a, a Bright Sellers or a uh, Spalding uh, Medical or a, you know, another high growth tech company or even established tech firm like Northwestern Mutual, which is doing very innovative things while they're here, um, while we're attracting them to Milwaukee and, and uh, have their attention? And, and keep them here and grow the economy. Mm -hmm. Either of you want to get in on that at all? Um, I have nothing to add. Okay. That was, that was well said. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 one, the one thing I would add also is I, um, there's a certain sort of uh, uh, cultural shift as far as uh, academia as well, I think that can, uh, that can really help as far as, you know, in, uh, again, thinking back to my time uh, at MIT, it was very, entering, uh, doing uh, entering academia, my, like my co-founder um, uh, has has did a master's degree, so he ended up sticking around. He didn't go right into in, into the startup world. Um, he ended up continuing doing uh, computer science and doing research. Um, there's n uh, that didn't preclude him from becoming an entrepreneur. If anything, that sort of those two paths were aligned. So I think that sort of culturally something to think about a little bit more too is that this is this is a common thing. This is something that can work, and it's uh, and you can go from uh, from that that world to, uh, to, a, to, to an entrepreneurial world. Richard, you, you mentioned Foxconn a couple of moments ago, and let, let's spend a, a several minutes on that. So we have this uh, potentially, um, people call it a potentially game-changing uh, project in southeastern Wisconsin. Um, what does that mean for, for the 
entrepreneurial sector? What does it mean for people who might want to start their own businesses? Is there a connection there? Could there be a connection there? And anybody can begin. Amanda, you want to start with that? Yeah, I think, I think it's in incredibly important anytime you're creating new high quality jobs in our region. Um, so I think it's a, a very exciting, you know, it's kind of, you know, the rising of the tide. Um, so I think, you know, and I think it can also support the overall ecosystem. So with the creation of the new jobs, the money going back into the economy and, and what different partners can do, I think it's um, just a very uh, supportive, or it, it can just really help seed a lot of um, overall growth in our region. So I think it's a very positive thing. Richard? Yeah, I think it's I think it's great. I think when we're talking about sort of you know uh, Milwaukee as a as a tech hub, I think that's mm -hmm. something that is uh, that's the that's a piece that we need. Um, thinking a little bit sort of you know from the perspective of an earlier stage company, though, it's a lot of money. And when I think about sort of how many you know how many early stage businesses could be funded, we want to see. While while I really like sort of I, I really like the the deal, I think it would be great to see that same. T it may be a little bit more work, but I'd like to see that same type of attention um, be given towards earlier stage uh, companies as well. Um, and I, I can sort of uh, imagine that there may, there may be um, similar, if not better, upside with a little bit of a focus towards earlier stage. What difference, Matt, do you think uh, Foxconn could potentially make? Uh, so the day that it was announced, I actually fielded through my recruiting business inbound interest from people that are wondering, you know, how does this, they had moved away from the region and um, we're wondering how does this impact our local tech ecosystem and I'd say a lot is still unknown as to the, the quality and the quantity of tech jobs, but any additional tech job here is good in my opinion. I think that any um, opportunity that people are talking about Wisconsin, and it's not about the Packers, beer, brats, or cheese, is a good thing <laughs> on a global stage. Um, you know, and it is a global company too. So you know, to have exposure in China, uh, you know, and and other markets, you know, in in Asia, uh, for people are wondering, you know, this large company is moving to Wisconsin of all places. I think that's a really exciting thing, and it could be a game changer. So. You know, we just have to wait and see. I, I do have to ask you about Richard's comment, though, because I was at an event uh, earlier this week uh, where something similar was said. Somebody said, uh, uh, raised the point, well, imagine if some of that money that's being given in incentives went to small, early stage companies. Yeah. Imagine what we, we could do. Um, I agree. I think three... Yeah. I think they should, the state should match the three billion uh, and create a three billion dollar venture capital fund, and I think that would be also a, a significant game changer for Wisconsin's economy. And uh, you know, now I guess the legislatures have to get to work. Yeah, to your to your scarcity point, right? Like, why not do both? Yeah, yeah. We should we should be doing both, yeah. and then we should be also looking at how we can support companies as they grow on to the next stage and the next stage. You know, Agreed. so. Something we talked about yesterday was there's a lot of early stage um, support, and then as companies get bigger and need additional funding to get onto their later stage rounds, um, you know, we, I think we should be doing all of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I want to, uh, before we take audience questions, I, I want to put this in very personal terms about starting your own business. The, 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 the most frightening parts of that, uh, the biggest challenges as you're getting this off the ground, the kinds of thoughts that go through your head mm -hmm. as you encounter things you probably never expected to encounter. Give us a sense of that with your own individual businesses. Richard, I'll begin with you. What, what moments were there that made you go, wow, I, I hope this works out? Or did you ever have <laughs> one of those moments? You were supremely confident throughout. <laughs> People like wine, they're gonna, they're gonna do it. We, we were optimistic. Okay. <laughs> but I think uh, this was sort of our pre-generator days. It was myself, Joe, my co-founder, our first employee, Maria. We had an 80 square foot office above uh, in Cambridge in Massachusetts, so near, near MIT. And literally like our elbows were touching and we were, we were like, we were launching this and we're two months into it and we're like we don't know if anyone's going to be interested in this and uh, fortunately enough I think we were able to uh, that uh, that sort of uh, we kind of approached it as this is a problem that we face as 25 year olds wanting to learn more about wine and get in getting into it hopefully that's something that applies to um, uh, th that applies to um, uh, people other than us and uh, I think we got um, a, 
uh, lucky in the sense that um, sort of the the business model um, that uh, that we had set out to uh, create made sense. But if it hadn't, I think that's um, we would have uh, we've had to hit the drawing board again. And then I think we we met Generator just uh, just at the right time, literally when we when we, when we were at a moment where I think we did uh, 20k in sales, which sounded like a lot at the time uh, for the month, and uh, and and said you know hey well, there's no way we can continue this unless we uh, Unless we can help build the business, unless we get help building the business to the next stage, fundraising, mentorship, um, a number of things. So I think, I think, uh, sort of thinking back to 2014, which I guess wasn't that long ago, I think that a, a number of things uh, lined up, but we weren't, we weren't always sure. It, it, it was not guaranteed. Yeah, you didn't feel exactly. that way at all. <laughs> Amanda, what was the, the the biggest challenge you faced in in getting this business up and running, or at least to where you are today? Sure. So. Um, I would say it was assessing the market need and really making sure that we had a, a product um, that was addressing the needs of the market. So we were testing in the market all the time. We were testing in a lot of different healthcare settings and really trying to dial in the solution to be sure that we um, had something that we could not only scale, um, but given the disruptive nature um, in the healthcare setting, um, we wanted to make sure we had all of the necessary components in place to help um, move that change through through healthcare, and so we did a lot of um, beta testing and testing in different clinics. And at the moment that we saw, we got data back from the market that said um, we had reduced ten unnecessary hospitalizations in ninety days. Was the moment I breathed because that was the validation from the market we needed to know we had something really unique, um, and. You know, I would say, you know, it's, it's, it's true. The, the, the highs are really high and the lows are really low and scary. Um, but when you have those, um, when you have that feedback from the market, that's what fuels you and keeps you going and, and, and know, you know that you're on the right path um, to, doing, to making high impact in, in a really valuable area. So, Matt, you've, you, you said earlier, you, you've had both experiences. You've had one that wasn't successful and you've had one that has been successful. Give us a sense of, of what the biggest challenges were in each of those, and why did one yeah. go one way and the other didn't go the other Well, I, I think it's critically important when you're launching a business, you have a, a good partners, and uh, you know the first uh, stumble may have been due to some partnership uh, challenges, as well as, you know, I just think that uh, starting a business is incredibly overwhelming. So doing that and going to college is a a challenge as well. Um, uh, you know, I think the first time that it, it seemed real was paying taxes. Um, you know, <laughs> both sides of FICA. Um, but uh, you know, I think that uh, you know, really, uh, the opportunity that I got while I was in school to go through an accelerator program, fail, and still you know keep studying and and earn a degree. Um, was incredibly important. So I actually launched a, an entrepreneurial education program along with the Greater Milwaukee Committee and Mike Lovell a few years ago called The Commons to give students an opportunity here in southeast Wisconsin to experience starting up a company in a, a safe environment at the optimal time for them to, to really do that. Um, so that was really, uh, you know, kind of cool. Um, you know, I think that um, you know, it's been a, a, a long challenge with Startup Milwaukee and Skills Pipeline. I think, you know, accessing talent here, tech talent here in, in, in Milwaukee and in Southeast Wisconsin is tough. I think changing the culture to embrace more uh, of a, a startup environment has been a, a challenge. But, um, you know, I think the momentum that we've seen in the past uh, week here and, and really in the past six or eight months, there is really sizable uh, energy and momentum uh, here in the startup community and tech community here in, in, in southeast Wisconsin and Wisconsin as a whole, and I think that's uh, really exciting. I'm going to finish on that point in a moment, but I did want to ask Richard one other question. So you mentioned that you, um, you needed venture capital mm -hmm. and, and a CSA, a venture capital fund. Uh, I think you said gave you $2 million or invested. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. I, I would say yeah. gave you. <laughs> invested $2 million. They're looking for money. Um, as you said, it's business. Um, but uh, part of it, that requires you to give the pitch. You have to make a compelling argument and present compelling facts for why you're a good investment. How mm -hmm. difficult was that? Hmm. Um. 
Well, it's, uh, I think it was, it's, it was definitely difficult um, in putting it all together because you don't, uh, back to where, uh, where, we, uh, where we were sort of when we first made that pitch was we were still based in Boston when we first made that pitch. And uh, I think that's sort of something where you can, uh, you put together your projections and, uh, you know, and you go through them and you're like, I think this is, this is what we can do, but you're never sure. And I think that's sort of, that's sort of one, of the, uh, one of the big things. And uh, I think at the time we were very, very excited and it was we had a compelling story and it made sense um, uh, it sort of we, the our projections were reasonable and we thought it was a it was a good idea of course but um, I think that that's uh, it is it is something that's uh, challenging I think you end up hearing um, always a lot more no's that, uh, than yeses of course so you just have to work through through that process and sort of how many um, no's did the, you get if I might ask I, I lose track yeah <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> yeah and it, it's something that you just uh, I probably not enough, actually, because I think at, at times I think we would we should have uh, cast an even wider net. So CSA is our lead uh, lead investor, and and um, they've invested the most. But we have um, about twenty five uh, different investors at this point. So it's sort of it's a process where if you assume if it's one in ten, it's you know I guess at least you know two hundred fifty mm -hmm. notes or two hundred forty notes. So yeah. So Matt <laughs> <laughs> Matt was saying he's. Uh, you sound like you're fairly bullish on things, and I want to wrap up our part of the conversation with, with each of you looking ahead. Um, so five years from now, what's, what's Milwaukee and Wisconsin going to look like in terms of startup activity? Will there be a significant change? What do each of you think about that, Amanda? I absolutely think so. I think um, we have been really vocal, and we've, we've come out there specifically in, the, in really in the last week and last several months, and we've we've made the we've we've made the claim we're we've, we're making a direct and serious intentional investment into startup in the region. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just by being intentional, we are going to start to see improvement. And um, so I'm very excited to see where it goes. Matt, uh, how bullish you, you you said you, you see good things happening, but yeah, how bullish are you? I'm extremely bullish. Right. Um, you know, I think that it uh, will take a lot of hard work. Um, but I think that the right stakeholders are at the table. And to have you know, some of the region's uh, you know, fledgling entrepreneurs or uh, growing entrepreneurs and some of the, the region's most established startups like Northwestern <laughs> Mutual, um, you know, really uh, coming together to address the issues that our region faces and really try to evolve us uh, to be competitive in the 21st century is, is a it's a pretty exciting time here in southeast Wisconsin and, and it's not to say this isn't a lot of other cities are doing this uh, you know we're talking yes. Cincinnati St. Louis Detroit and there are a lot of cities trying to do this and bring all the parties together to that the same is, table that is true and I think that that is something that we need to realize as a region is um, you know we are uh, you know facing real competition from other Midwestern cities to uh, attract and retain this talent to build this type of environment. So we all have to work together and really embrace the growth mindset to move us uh, forward. I'll give you the final word on this, Richard. What do you think? Five years out from now, what, what will the, the ecosystem, as I think we referred to it, look like in Milwaukee and Wisconsin? <clears throat> yeah, I'm very bullish, and I think that this is, uh, Milwaukee is going to become a, uh, a tech hub. And I think that, uh, if anything, when I look back to the past two and a half years at Bright Sellers and us growing from three employees to 37 employees, like, I genuinely think that this was the best place to do that. It's. Um, I think we would have. Um, I think we would have had a harder time in another place, and that's a testament to how willing um, the community here is uh, to put um, effort into into that. Whether it's investment, mentorship, whether it's even sort of uh, so, uh, just when we're you know we sell to consumers, but some of our best customers are here um, uh, in, in Wisconsin. I think that this. I, I really see us becoming a tech hub, and and us having the um, the uh, t us being able to set the uh, set the bar um, to uh, to aspire to that. How many subscribers do you think you'll have in a couple of years? Um, a couple the of growth years model. Uh, uh, Seventy-five thousand, hundred thousand, hopefully. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Let's uh, take some questions from the uh, the audience. If you're in the seating bowl, press down on the rim, not on the ball, but on the rim. Uh, we'll listen to your question. If you're in the back. If you can wait for Ryan, he's got a microphone. We'll be glad to take your questions. Uh, keep them brief. We'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, Frank, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, since we're sitting here in a law school, I'm wondering uh, what 
from your perspective, are the various legal issues that you encounter in connection? We've heard about uh, the non-compete agreements, which I hear from clients are very difficult to enforce. Uh, so there's, a, there's those issues. But what are the other legal issues that you face as you start up these companies? Yeah. I can lead off, I guess. So, of course, we're in a fairly regulated industry, and it's interesting. Um, one of the things that, uh, fortunately, sort of the, uh, fortunately, as far as, you know, when you think sort of just wine and direct shipping of wine, uh, sort of the world has been opening up in that realm. And so, but we are doing a lot of, a lot of things that are fairly new, especially for being based in, 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 in Wisconsin. There's a lot of precedent in, in California, of course, where the majority of wine is being produced uh, in the United States. But that's something that's, interesting for us to navigate. We don't think it's unlike a lot of um, other industries, say um, Uber and Lyft or Airbnb or those type of industries where there really hasn't been a whole lot of precedent set for, um, for, a, uh, for, for e-commerce or for, uh, for a digital company. Most of our largest competitors that we view as competitors are um, companies that have been around since the, since the end of prohibition. So um, that's sort of interesting for us. It's a, been a learning process for us. There's a lot of things that we wish could go um, a lot faster Fortunately, we've been able to um, we've been able to have the help that we need to, um, uh, to 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 scale bright sellers. But it is something that we think about a lot. I think that's also exciting for us because since a lot of states have opened up to direct shipping of wine very recently, uh, that also presents a uh, a market opportunity. So it's interesting to sort of be in a, be in a space where we can be the first uh, company to um, to really uh, develop um, a product that uh, that is uh, that's for a new sort of environment, and it really is what consumers are uh, are looking for right now. So it's uh, it's an exciting. I think it's an exciting time for uh, for for the wine industry in particular. Yeah. Anybody else? On that? Yeah. Um, so on the healthcare side, practicing medicine. So for, for us, we get um, a report, and and that report can be read uh, logistically can be read by a doctor in Reno. But um, because of lack of federal law on how to on, on telemedicine between um, state lines, that's created a major barrier for us. And so legally, we have to do a lot to kind of work around that. Um, and I know that that goes the same with like selling a class two medical device on Amazon. Um, so there's different levels of licensure and different level, you know, different things you need to do to be able to. Um, you know, really take your product into more of like the e-commerce setting. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say there's, a, I think there's a great opportunity also for um, law firms in this area to offer startup legal programs. Um, you know, so to say for, you know, startups are all about, you got finite time and capital. So, you know, you know what your, your legal budget is and um, with that comes, you know, a certain number of, of startup, you know, securities documents, whatever you need. Um, and I think that uh, there's, we're starting to see some of that, but I think more of that would be really helpful. Yeah, I'd add that uh, the resource uh, here at Marquette University, the Law and Entrepreneurship Center, has been a tremendous asset to several entrepreneurs. Uh, in the community providing free legal advice and delivered by law students um, and really kind of has been a, a great catalyst for the startup community. Um, I think that the law could be used as a competitive advantage to, to make Milwaukee, put Milwaukee on the map. So I think, you know, Richard mentioned Uber, Lyft, the regulations around that. Um, a great example of, you know, a city that has used changing the regulatory environment uh, in their backyard is, is actually one that falls 40th out of 40 uh, large metros. Pittsburgh has really used um, regulations around autonomous vehicles to attract companies like Uber and Google to do research in their city and create new jobs. So how do we elect leaders in the region that, uh, you know, change policy to make us uh, a, a tech hub, I think, is an important issue that we should should face. One final point on that. I think, uh, if I, I'm pretty sure of this, I think next week, for, as part of Startup Week, there's actually something here at the law school that, that deals with some of the, the legal issues, Frank, that, that are arising from you know the whole growth in entrepreneurship. So um, yes. I next, think it, uh, next yeah. Wednesday okay, at noon good. here. Good. Um, I have the whole schedule memorized. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, glad there's also a great blockchain event here at Marquette. Don't ask me what blockchain is, but Heather Sullivan over there can answer that. She, that's okay. next Thursday, uh, 8 to noon, right, uh, at Weasler Auditorium. 
So He's got it, Heather. He knows <laughs> it. Yeah. Did you want to say something? Yeah, something I wanted to add to that point is I think it's uh, it's very exciting because we you know, Wisconsin is not um, not a large wine producing state. Most of the wine at Bright Cellars is from is from California or is international wine. But the interesting thing, back to the opportunity for sort of uh, thinking about um, thinking about uh, regulatory issues, is that um, the. Bright Cellars could be a company that operates pretty much at everywhere, in, like anywhere in the world. And that's really interesting when we think about e-commerce and disintermediation and uh, how we can, there's a lot of opportunities. There are a lot of companies that could, that could have an advantage being here uh, based on the regulatory environment, but essentially are doing, have a global footprint. So that's, that's the hope. Um, and I think one of the exciting pieces for us is that even though um, a lot of our fulfillment um, and, and sort of things touch a, a number of different states, our, we're headquartered here and it's not and for us it's an advantage so I think that's really a big opportunity mm -hmm. other questions please raise your hand and we'll, and we'll get to them sure um, I was in one of the first uh, uh, future Milwaukee classes about 25 years mm -hmm. ago and I remember then that, uh, we had people come in and talk to us and they said well, there's Chicago and there's Minneapolis and there's a sleepy little, little town in Milwaukee sitting here. I get the feeling that's changed. The Calatrava was built. Now the Bucks Arena. Uh, do you think we're changing fast enough or are we still be going to kind of be behind these other major areas? I think that question's yet to be answered. Um, you know, I think that uh, there is a lot of great infrastructure being built in our city, uh, whether it's the arena or, or the Calatrava, um, you know, and, and really some exciting momentum around that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it just, it'll take time. And um, uh, I, when I was 25 years ago, I was three years old. So uh, <laughs> I, I can't really compare between now and then and now, but, you know, in the past six or eight months, I just really do think there's a lot of energy uh, coming uh, to, around to support entrepreneurs here in the region. Mm -hmm. You both agree with that? Yeah. Do. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Other questions? Anybody in the back? Anybody? Sure. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, events next week. What what are what's going on next week, and uh, is there room for others to be involved? Or what's happening? Yep, so in Milwaukee, um, that's the one I'm most familiar with, but we've got uh, events happening in 10 cities around the state uh, for Wisconsin Startup Week. Milwaukee Startup Week kind of has, I think, three or four key themes. One is uh, providing a bunch of free and open to the public educational workshops for entrepreneurs, whether it's on marketing, sales, legal advice, um, you know, really anything there. Um, another key theme is highlighting our local health tech entrepreneurship scene. Uh, Amanda's a health tech startup. There are several health tech startups we've identified here in Milwaukee and Aurora's investing in them and, and other uh, freighter. It's also doing quite a bit around building uh, programs to support entrepreneurs here in the region. Um, so that's another key theme is that supporting and really showcasing our region's health tech entrepreneurship. Third theme is really connecting uh, local corporations, whether it's Aurora, Northwestern Mutual, A.O. Smith, uh, to um, the startup community here and to entrepreneurs here. Um, and then kind of uh, a fourth theme is really showcasing the tech community. So there are a bunch of workshops and, and different events, the blockchain conference here at Marquette, um, which is really blockchain is a very uh, bleeding edge technology and I can't get into detail <laughs> as to what it is, but Heather's got all your answers over there. Um, but um, you know, what's great about Milwaukee Startup Week and Wisconsin Startup Week is, is we make all those events free and open to the public. Um, so please engage in, in the week and, and attend as many events as, as you can. There are at least 40 here in Milwaukee. There are over 200 statewide, so uh, hope to see you there. Other questions? Yes. Is there a website or something that people could go and find mm -hmm. schedules? Yes, I should plug that. It's wistartupweek.org slash Milwaukee um, or uh, Startup Milwaukee. If, uh, if you Google Startups in Milwaukee, you'll find it for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I've been <coughs> seeing a blood pressure machine advertised that just you put it on your wrist and you can take your blood pressure. And I went to some doctor appointments and they seem to go to that technology now as compared to the old 
pump it up and put it on your shoulder. So is there a big, um, is there going to be a big change in how we um, take our vitals and take care of ourselves where we can do it at home easier? That's, that's the goal in my opinion. Um, you know, as healthcare is moving, um, you know, there's economic pressures to help take healthcare out side of the hospital into the home setting. And so I think there's a lot of innovation around that technology, um, supporting companies who are um, innovating in that space so that we can successfully bring healthcare out to the home. Um, and I hope to be integrated with that product. Mm -hmm. I hope to, I, we hope to be in the home too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems like a great product because it's so clumsy to do it the old way. And That's right. You just put it on your wrist and boom. You're... Other questions? Yes. <laughs> Do we need a, a change or an improvement to our regional uh, public relations in support of startups? And mm -hmm. who are the uh, people that are most influential in that domain? Are you talking about politically or, are you, you know, or? Just the whole public relations aspect of mm -hmm. um, both politically and, yeah. and economically. Aren't we telling our story well enough? We aren't. Um, and I think that that's one of the key things that uh, we'd love to address at uh, you know, Startup Milwaukee and uh, Skills Pipeline is how do we better brand our region as a hub of technology talent? How do we talk about some of the success stories, whether it's you know, a, a startup like Bright Sellers or a, um, you know, a, a tech company? A lot of people don't realize the zip file, which everyone's probably used if you've used a PC, it was invented in Milwaukee. Um, some of the first machine learning uh, kind of languages and, and stuff was invented by Alan Bradley here in Milwaukee. Um, so we have been doing tech for a long time, and we've been doing a pretty good job at it. Um, so the question is, how do we uh, celebrate it and really get those stories out there at, at a national stage? And one of the things I think we could do is actually you know, create more programs like the one Bright Sellers uh, participated in, Generator, that attracted uh, you know, them here to the region. Explain to that. Jobs. Just so people have a clear understanding of what Generator is and what it does for a young company. Help them yep. understand so that. So it's, it's an accelerator program. So it's a, Richard's definitely the expert here, but uh, it's a, a very intense process where, um, you know, it, it brings entrepreneurs here, um, you know, and introduces them to investors, introduces them to corporate partners, introduces them to mentors. And, you know, hopefully some of those companies stay here in the region. Um, there are regions around the country. Uh, St. Louis has a phenomenally successful accelerator program called Arch Grants, which actually gives usually an accelerator like generators making equity investment in a company. Uh, Arch Grants gives entrepreneurs that are willing to move to St. Louis $50,000 to get off and running. Uh, and connects them to a bunch of mentors, mentors and, and investors and capital. And, and that program has created 500 jobs in St. Louis. So I think, you know, how do we look at uh, creating more programs like that uh, here in, in the region to, to be competitive? Did you want to? Yeah, sure. I think it's definitely an asset. I mean, having gone through the program and sort of really been able to realize um, realize growth for bright sellers, but also it's one of the things while we're talking about lists, I believe Generator is ranked top 15 in the country, and for a market of this size, it's 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 up there. And it's uh, I think that's one of the exciting things that, that is that companies are um, are uh, coming around pr participating in the program. Being uh, I think we talked a lot about sort of exposure, and, and once you're here, it's a little bit it's a little bit different. I didn't know the First thing about Milwaukee until until uh, until moving here, and um, actually one other point to make is that back to what I was saying earlier from a branding uh, from a branding perspective, I think there's an opportunity for. Um, there, there's an opportunity to focus on the upside, as, as Matt was talking about the successes. I think when you look at a lot, uh, look at a lot of sort of branding for the region, we're talking about quality of life, which I think is fantastic. Infrastructure, which I think is great. Like I think those things are good, but really, what is going to drive entrepreneurs to move here is when they think about maximizing that upside potential for their business. Um, that this is the right that this is the right place to be, and I think that's something that uh, is an opportunity. Okay. Do you think we need any, uh, are we telling our story? Amanda, I'll give you the final word. Are, are we telling our story well enough? Um, I, I don't, I don't think we are. And I, I don't think we're talking about, um, I, I don't think we're talking enough about what we do well. And I don't think we're talking enough about what we're, what we're struggling with. And I think we, we need have to have an honest conversation about it. So yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to do more of both. 
Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to wrap things up there. If I can just have your attention for a couple of things here, and then we'll thank our guests. Uh, our next event is a week from today. Uh, Ricardo Diaz, who is the executive director of the United Community Center, which is a uh, really a, a very strong, uh, wonderful organization on the near south side of Milwaukee, will be with us. Um, I think that is uh, sold out, but you can watch it at law.marquette.edu. You can stream all of our events and watch them live or go back and look at them later. Um, so we did want to mention that. Uh, we also have a couple of other events before the end of this semester. Uh, so please, again, check the website uh, for details on that. Uh, I want to do something a little different here before uh, we go, and I want to mention um, something that's happening um, that's connected with the College of Communication, which is just across the parking lot of JZU. Um, right after the Ricardo Diaz uh, event here on Thursday of next week, if you're interested, uh, the O'Brien Fellowship in Public Service Journalism is doing a conference here. Uh, it'll be late afternoon, and, and it's... It's really quite fascinating. The Pulitzer Prize winning science journalist for the Journal Sentinel, Mark Johnson, will be here. Some of you may have seen the, uh, the work that he's doing right now in the newspaper. It's about uh, pandemics. It's about how uh, uh, deadly viruses like Zika move from uh, plant, from uh, animals to humans. Uh, it's a really good series, and he'll be talking about that and leading a conference here. So that starts at 2.30 next Thursday after the Ricardo Diaz event. So if you're interested, please stick around for that. Having said that, I appreciate everybody's time and attention and interest in this subject today. Um, this is a good conversation to have and one that I hope the community will have for many more years in the future. And we can talk about all the good stuff that's happening in the Milwaukee area and in Wisconsin. I want to thank our guests today. Uh, please give them another uh, round of applause for being with us. Great to see you. Thank you.